Hello and welcome to our weekly Parsha Shira with the commentary of the Al Shekha Kodesh. Uh, this week's Parsha is the Parsha of Tazria. And it starts off, well, we're going to see what it starts off when I read to you in the Homish, but famously it starts off by talking about aspects of Tuma, a very, very loaded word, normally translated as impurity, which it doesn't really mean at all. However, we'll, we'll use that as a, a working definition before we start to uh, uh, smooth it and polish it. Uh, let me explain that it talks about the impurity that comes after a birth, after a birth of a boy, after the birth of a girl. As the also is going to point out, it, it's strange that it, it interposes in the middle of the, the conversation about human impurities, spiritual impurities, because they are spiritual impurities. Um, why um, it, it, does the Torah suddenly stop, start talking about bris mila? And they also has got some very interesting insights here. I'm going to go into some... Uh, really uh, delicate matters, um, but from a Kabbalistic really, uh, point of view. Before we do so, uh, I'm going to read to you uh, from my latest book called Truly Great Jewish Women Then and Now. And um, so, and again, uh, the, the quote here is on page 36. It's uh, on the subject of Rivka. Um, and it's, uh, as you can see here, it's also from the Alsha, so it's translated, so I can read it quickly to you. So he says the following thing, and I'm going to come back in, back to this theme shortly. The damage wrought by Adam and Chava, that's of course eating from the tree of knowledge, mysterious and enigmatic story, was greatly repaired by Abram and Sarah. That process of repair was continued after them by Yitzchak and Rivka, and of course by Yaakov and his wife. Um, the Zohar says that the Ovas and Imas were connected to Adam and Chava through Gilgal. That is to say that the Ovas and the Imas of the Jewish people all had aspects or were the souls of Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, reincarnated. Of course, the point of reincarnation is something that comes up in our shirim over the, over the weeks and the months, now years, is, of course, that you're here in order to achieve certain things. If you don't achieve them, it's conceivable that you'll be sent back to have another go. Or if you were here in a previous time and made mistakes, did damage, you might be sent back in order to repair that damage in a different life. How that would work out is not really the topic this year, but somehow or other, God would engineer you back in a new body, in a new life, and somehow you put right the mistakes that you made before. That's the idea of Gilgal Neshama's reincarnation. The Obas, Abram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and their wives, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah, uh, they were the reincarnations of Adam and Chava. They're back in order to repair the damage they did. What damage? The big damage. The, the, the biggest damage of all, the eating from the tree of knowledge. So let me read a little bit more. The Zohar says that all the Obas and Imos, patriarchs and matriarchs of the Jewish people, were connected to Adam and Chava through Gilgal reincarnation. And that's why the Ovis were buried alongside them in the cave of Machpelah, apart, apart of course from Rachel. Uh, why was Adam, uh, Abram, so keen to buy the cave of Machpelah to be buried there, for his family to be buried there? Because, as strange as it sounds, they were already buried there. If after all the reincarnations of Adam and Chava, then by definition, uh, they, were already, they were already there, at least in the previous form. Okay. Uh, and that is why, uh, so they along them and gave my pill. And that is why the repair of the damage Chava caused was signaled through three mitzvahs. And the damage that Chava caused, hmm, and this is, of course, she eats the tree of knowledge from the tree of knowledge first and then gives it to Adam. Um, that, she, that I've written here, or the Alshaf writes here, was caused. We're going to come back to that. We're going to look at this week's partial as well. But I've got something to say in that. Uh, and the, the, so that, and those, what were the three mitzvahs? The, the mitzvahs, the, the ultimate, as it were, woman's mitzvahs is Mida, um, Chala, and Shabbos light, lighting Shabbos lights. And we know, of course, these three uh, uh, mitzvahs, um, when Sora died, they, the role passed on to Rivka, or Rivka, the tent of Rivka, was a, a truly a, a reconstruction, a, re, a rebirth of the, of, the, of the tent of Sora, the miracles that occurred the supernatural events that occurred in, in Sarah's tent were uh, 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 performed for Rafik as well. Good. So again, Mida, Chala, and Shabbos lights. We talk, of course, then in our Friday night davening. Um, and the Shabbos, so what was that? So the, the, the Chala and the Shabbos lights were, lasted forever. 
And these three mitzvahs relate to the three of, uh, of the four, relate to three of the four spiritual elements of the human being, which are called ruach, nefesh, and guf, so the physical. And then the spiritual is ruach and nefesh, spirit and soul. But there's a fourth aspect, and that is the neshama. Uh, neshama, I usually try to translate that as super soul. People translate freely nefesh and neshama as both being souls. But as I've told you many times in our sharing together, there's no such thing as a synonym in Loshna Kaidish. So they have to be different things, and they are indeed. Uh, every, every human being has a nefesh, but a neshama is unique to Jews, usually referred to as being an extra degree of super soul, extra degree of soul to carry the extra burden of the extra mitzvahs that Jews have to carry and more than non-Jewish people. Good. The fourth element is neshama, which was not affected by Adam's sin. No, so how does that work? So chala parallels the process that creates the physical body of a human being. Of course, human body, uh, human body comes from the earth, earth to uh, from the earth or made from the earth, which like wheat comes from the ground. Chaba's sin turned Adam's body from something completely pure and wholly into something physical and mortal. So because we're physical, we wear out, we die. But before then our bodies were not physical. In fact, it seems to be from the Zohar and various other uh, Kabbalistic sources that Adam and Chava were creatures of light. So they did not wear out. Okay. Um, so therefore, Sarah's life acted to reverse that process. When she separated the Chala, the process produced something holy and a miracle occurred. The dough expanded and lasted an entire week. This, is, this indicated she was successful in returning the physical state to a holy and pure one once more, separating the good from the bad. Death, which came through the world of Chava's mistake, was also made to retreat through Sarah's life, and that's hinted at by Nida. Every occurrence of Nida happens when a potential life was never actualized and dies. Obviously, that's the process, a monthly process of a woman's body, where a potential life, a little egg, uh, travels in its journey. It didn't become fertilized, didn't grow into a complete life, and therefore it's a, it's a, a minor death, if you can use such a phrase. Blood is identified with the nefesh, uh, for the blood is the soul, it says in Devorim. When Chava sinned, the nefesh was damaged. Sarah, who repaired that damage, had never been Anita until just before she would conceive a child. Um, now, we'll come back to that as well. Yitzchak was a, a well, it was Yitzchak. So essentially, she was not actually Anita at all. The Shechina rested above her tent in the form of a cloud, um, and, and that signaled that but there was no negativity from Nida with her. Of course, she never had a woman, so there would be no Nida. They, thus, Sarah repaired the damage that the Nefesh suffered. The Ruach of humanity, which symbolizes a person's light, was wounded by Chava, too. That wound was referred to as the dimming of the light, Kabbalistic. The light that Chava extinguished would be rekindled through Sarah, and that was shown through the miracle of the Shabbos light, that stayed lit all week, a bit like the Hanukkah lights, only Hanukkah lights all the time. Rivka's arrival brought the three miracles uh, back to life and demonstrated she was fit to carry on the path of Sarah. So that's the uh, part of the of the book, of my, my latest book. But it takes us into this this interesting concept of we, the al really talks to that there. Chaba bring death to the world, uh, Nida being a, a, a symbol of death, and this week's Parsha talks about that. So if we turn here uh, and just let me read a little bit of this week's Parsha, the Parsha Yub Sukkim, and then we'll look at what the Alshach has to say. And he's got some very interesting things to say. He says, Vidab Hashem al this is the very beginning, uh, chapter Yud base of Vayikra, chapter 12. First boss of Hashem speaks to Moshe and he says, Dabra Rabbi Israel speaks to the Jewish people. The more say, Ishak, he says, Ria, the woman who, well, I'll, I'll turn to the art scroll and let them translate it. Uh, a woman who conceives, it's probably going to say, when a woman conceives, yes, okay. Tazria, Vayol uh, the and she has, gives birth to a, a male child, then she's going to, a, then she's going to be uh, the Toma Shivas Yomim. She's going to be Tommy. Hmm. Now, everything that Tuma, we've discussed this before, the word Tuma, which I was struggling with or uncomfortable with using before, is always connected to death, right? So as I said, Nida is a failed life. Um, and that means hints of the mortality of human beings, which she introduced to the world by eating from the Eitz Adas, then giving it to Adam to eat. And of course, we are all their children, therefore that's why we are physical and we're going to die. So therefore, uh, for seven days after the birth, she is going to be a Nida, Shiva Siyamim, 
but you may need it during the Vosalachitma, through that period of, of her being needed for seven days after the birth, then that's when she's going to be Tommy. Okay. Uh, in other words, a uh, connection to death. Oh, but you must read about the eighth day, Yemo, Bosa, or Losa, but the eighth day, then is Bris Mila. And so this is why is it talking about Bris Mila here? What's that got to do with Tuma? The whole book is the whole, so the whole part is talking about Tuma. Uh, so that's the first thing. Oh, but you must read in the eighth day, Yemo, Bosa, or Losa. The Shloshim Yam, the Shloshim Yam, Yam, Tesh of the Dime to Hora. And there's a 33 a, a day period of uh, getting out of the Tuma state. Um, and then they called Kodesh Latiga, Bela Mikdash Lasavoy, and you can't come near the base of Mikdash in that state, and you can't touch anything which is holy food, Kodshim, etc. And Malaz, you made a horror until she's fulfilled that, pre- that process. So it's 40 days if she's had a boy. She's had a girl, it's exactly twice that process. But here's the concept of Nida, concept of Tuma. And let's see what the Alshach has to say in that, because I think it's extremely interesting. It will take us in interesting directions. A bit Kabbalistic to begin with, uh, and then we shall uh, uh, hmm. we'll look at two other things as well. Something from the Shem Mishmal, and something from the Ovis de Rabbi Nossin. That is uh, Rabbi Nossin's version of Pirkei Ovis. Slightly different, but very different uh, to the normal Pirkei Ovis that you and I are familiar with. Okay, so the Alshach starts, and I, of course, reach for my Alshach. This is the version, of course, we use and by, uh, by asking two questions. Now, I'm in page Ayn Dalit, just in case anybody has that and wants to follow in. Uh, and here is what he has to say. So he says the following thing. Um, I want to give you, establish two facts here. One, Echod. So here's an astonishingly interesting thing. Nida is always considered to be the, ble- the bleeding, the, the blood that comes from the womb. However, as Rashi says, and the Alshach echoes here, uh, that a, per- a woman is a Nida, even were it to be the case that her, her cervix would open, the womb would open, that no blood came out. Of course, that's probably something that never actually would happen. Um, but were it to happen, even still, she would be Tommy Nida. Tommy Yolendos, which doesn't make any sense because no blood has flowed. So what does that mean? And the Afila Nidikas of Akeba Bolotam, even where her her, uh, uh, her womb to open without any blood, Kizulas Mashi I Esha Shalo Yatsas Mat, leaving that aside as being this hour, but assuming such a possibility would exist, which he did, which he says is, is not going to be, uh, uh, which would never be real, never be a reality. Hello, Hoyla Baat Smalios Isoidoi Nimeno Midam Nidosa Roy, who she would say so, but the fact she had a child, a child who was conceived through the process of, well, the normal process of gynecological processes, um, then and, and down the blood of, of the womb, etc., which normally uh, would make her a nita because of blood only from the womb that creates a person being a nita. But that's the same blood that we, all of us, were created from. So in a sense, blood or blood of Nida is the blood which actually has been contaminated, we're going to see that in a second, was a, 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 a part of the contamination of the nochush of the snake when he first um, got Chava to eat from the tree of knowledge. Now, I've been playing with the idea that I should really make a special shear on Rabbi Bessler, his explanation of how Ottoman Chava came to this state in the first place. It's genius. It's brilliant. And it's the for volume two of Mita Malio. So I think I will do that. So that will be, that share will go up uh, hopefully before next week's Parsha share. So please keep an eye out for that. Uh, I know that this whole concept of Adam Akhaba is extremely enigmatic. Uh, I'm only giving you headlines. I, uh, I know that you know there's depth there. I need to really go, go into that uh, in, as, a, as a topic in its own right. However, I will be alluding to various things that, that point to the depth, depth of what was really going on. So basically, um, the, the act of giving birth to a child, a child who's conceived in a place where the, 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 the blood of, of, of the womb is present, that itself brings a degree of tumor into the world. Because she already, the first woman already brought a degree of tumor, and remember, tumor equals death, into the world. 
So even were it to be the case that somehow or other she could birth their child without any blood there, but the fact that the child was created through the blood, and as we'll see in a second, when she's nursing the child stained through blood, and when she's a nida, that means that the child is being contaminated again by the, the milk, the mother's milk, which of course, as we know, a woman's breast takes blood, it takes blood and turns it into milk. And if this blood is blood nida, uh, of Omnida, then of course the contamination, the spiritual contamination carries on. We'll see what the spiritual contamination thing means in a second. Okay, so that's point number one. So point number one he wants to know is, uh, be, uh, be, uh, the, uh, fact number one, is that the, the state of Nida hints at death, hints at, at the human state after a, 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 a have a sin, on have an Adam sin, and the second one, and that's why it will be on the eighth day that he will be circumcised. Because for the first seven days, when she's still Anida, because the Torah says that that process, the Anida stops, the, the bleeding will stop, and bleeding again is contaminated by the, the fact that there is bleeding, there is mortality as, uh, um, which is aligned or, or, or connected to, to, to Anida. That process stops after seven days, as the apostle we just read says, and at that point, then he's not being nursed by a woman who is Anita anymore. And at that point, then we can cut away the brace, uh, we can do the brace meal and cut away the foreskin. Fine. So let me read a little bit more to you. Kidam hu lefiha emes, asher hu yoinak bilti tovar leben beyom shmini. So the child on the eighth day is going to brace meal because up to then he was being sustained, he was being nursed by his mother, and his blood. That, or rather, the milk came from blood, the blood came from Anita, etc., etc. So that answers the question which we posed at the beginning. Why should it be that we're talking about Anita and, and Tula like that? It talks, it talks about a bris mila. It emphasizes the eighth day after she stops being a Nida after birth. That's when you can do this whole idea of, of bris mila. Hmm. All right. That's what the Alshur has to say on that. But this is, this is very strange concepts. I'm sure you would agree. Um, let's read on a little bit further. Two more questions. Um, and the first question he wants to know is why does it say Parshas Tazria? Why does Parshas Tazria come after Parshas Shemini? Now, last week we talked about that, like what's something called the Ber Yosef, I think, if I remember last week's share correctly. Uh, Rabbi Yosef Salant, who talks about it, and the Alshach says the exact same thing. So Rabbi Yosef Salant, who's lived, you know, a couple of, I think a couple of hundred years ago, or maybe less than like a couple hundred years ago. Um, but the Alshak lived much, much longer, uh, further back. Talmud of Rabbi Yosef Karo. Um, so we're talking that uh, the Alshak was certainly uh, ahead of this um, this concept, or before he came, and uh, before it was echoed by uh, Rabbi Yosef Salanta. So he says the following interesting thing. He says, why is it that Parshas uh, Tazri, which talks about human tumor, uh, it comes after Parsha Shmini, which talks about animals who are Tommy. And I think we, if you remember, might, uh, we might uh, uh, have talked about that in more depth last week. And the second thing he says, why is a child, if it is the case that a child is born um, with a foreskin, why is a child born, a boy, a boy born with a foreskin? Why is born with a born with foreskin? Then we have to cut it away. Why not make the child born without a foreskin? As my Rabbeinu was born without a foreskin. As Dovid Amalek was born without a foreskin. And apparently Mashiach will be born or when he's born, he's born without a foreskin. So why is there such a thing as a Mila? Why is there a necessity? Why didn't God make us born without a foreskin so we didn't have to do this? And the answer is he did. But we'll come back to this in a second. Okay, um, those are the questions he asks. Let me jump in and we'll do a little bit more uh, inside the answer. Ach, omnum kasher bo nochesh al chavas. Let's go back to the very beginning of the story. Now, as I told you before, this is all uh, symbolic, effectively. If Adam and Chava, Adam and Chava were not uh, creatures of light, uh, physical creatures at all, but rather creatures of light, what does it mean, foreskin? That's a physical thing. Um, they would have to be born without a foreskin, but there's a metaphor, there, it, there's, a real, there's, a, there's an echo to our reality. And uh, let's see what he says. Ach, well, when the Nochaj managed to persuade Chava to eat from the tree of knowledge, Hetel Bozum, and I created a contamination in her, Behachti Iso, the fact that he'd made her sin. So somebody who was pure, somebody who was uh, uh, beyond or a, 
uh, ability to understand what a human being could be, or the original human being was, um, then there, or there was a contamination. And the contamination came from the Nochosh. Uh, that's the metaphor. We know that that meant that freedom of choice as we understand that the Yitzhahara, which is now part of us, that entered into us. That was not the case from before. As I said, I'll tackle that as a whole share in its own right uh, during the week, hopefully, from, uh, from Rabbi Desta. So this is my gamla resin is all the Pirkei of Rebbe Lezen, and then the Pirkei of Rebbe Lezen, like it's a medrash, says, Omrim ki rochov somal al hanochosh ki rochov al sis. The Samal directed, some people say he was Samuel, the Sultan, he directed events of the Nochosh, whatever Nochosh means, um, in, those, in those days to, to do exactly what he did in order to contaminate humanity. Okay. But the main, the main contamination was by Chava. Chava was contaminated by the primary source, which is the Sultan himself. She contaminates Odom. So that level of contamination, the, contamin the change state, the transformation from a, essentially a spiritual creature, a creature of light, into a physical creature, affected by the, the uh, having evil, potential for evil inside them, us, in other words, the primary change or changed one was Chava, and then its secondary is going to change uh, change all the Mauritian. That does not say, as, uh, mean in this, uh, as we'll see in a second, that she's inferior to him. In fact, as the whole theme of that book I just quoted to, uh, my book I quoted to you from, uh, before, shows the opposite. But her responsibility for changing the human condition to the way it is now, even though that women within that new human condition are superior to men, but still, they put us there in the first place. Or did they? I'll come back to that shortly. Um, good. So, because she was the primary one that was contaminated by the son, but she went on to contaminate him. So maybe an example would be somebody touches something which is radioactive. Uh, the Chernobyl uh, um, thing, the firefighters who went in to fight the nuclear fire, of course you can't fire, a, 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 fight a nuclear fire with, with water. They didn't know that. Um, they died after about two or three days. So they were primarily, they were affected. Their wives visiting them, they couldn't be in the same room because they would be a secondary infector or radiator um, uh, or radioactive radi radi contamination to them. But it might not be as bad. In fact, one woman actually, if I remember right, reading an account of this, actually, actually held her husband's hand, remarried, had a child, and, and lived a normal life. Didn't get cancer. The child wasn't born, you know, affected by this. Um, so it's possible to, as it were, the primary person is affected badly. In fact, they all died, um, but could contaminate somebody else, but at a lesser level. So he says that's what happened with Chava. Chava was contaminated by the Nochash. She contaminates Odom, but it wasn't as as potent a contamination. But Vikhu Harava Odom Gamu. Um Kain Hoyasa loyal clawless dam and you don't say who mamish machos and zoo. And dam nida is a direct change, one of the changes that women would occur uh, to women, uh, changes for men as well. But the, the the human condition then changed, and one of the human conditions was Nida. And again, Nida suggests death. Okay. Um, good. That means, therefore, um, as that the effect that it had on the, on the male human being was that they now had a foreskin. The foreskin would now be growing, have grown, to, as it were, be an, an extra degree of taiva, extra degree of physical desire, which wasn't there before at the critical place where normal uh, negative physical desire is located. That, when we cut that away, is our attempt, our statement that we're trying to reject the, the effects of that, just like Abram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, as we said before, and their wives undid or tried to undo the damage uh, of, the, of, of, the, of Adam and Chava, who they were direct descendants of, obviously, and now we're saying they were reincarnations of. But that process was actually completed when we stood in Mount Sinai with the Jewish people achieved or reachieved the level of Adam, a, 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 Adam and Gan Eden. And having not made the eagle of, then we would have transformed ourselves completely uh, to the level that he was there, uh, he had there. 
Uh, but we fall again. But we're, we're, at least when we're, we're circumcising, we're trying to say we're cutting away the effects or trying to cut away or reverse the effects of the nochash. And that's really the role of the Jewish people as a whole, uh, uh, ultimately. Fine. So that uh, he explains on page, uh, page I a little bit further on um, why uh, it talks uh, human beings born in oral, is born with a foreskin, and why, or I didn't say this too much, but why Itzadik, sorry, Itzadria and Shemini are connected. Because as we said, remember from last week, in Shemini it talks about animals and a cow is always a kosher animal. It may become treif, it may become ill or sick or wounded with a wound or an illness that will leave it dead within a 12 month period, but it is a kosher cow who's treif. And we can't eat something that's treif. Of course, treif is used euphemistically to talk about non-kosher animals, but that's not true. Uh, a treif animal is a kosher animal that's, be that's become sick. Where at, so these animals, a cow is always kosher, a sheep's always kosher, said that sweet. A cow, a pig's always always not kosher, a hare, um, and all these sorts of things are not kosher, and different animals are not kosher. Um, and they stay, they, they're constant like that. But human beings do change. Our levels go up and down. We were originally on such a high level. We were, uh, the, the, the Malachian could not, uh, we, they mistook us for God. Can you believe such a thing? The Medrash says they mistook us for God. They couldn't differentiate between the Odomarishan as he was and the Shemiz Baruch. Of course, we know that no matter how great he was, he was a mere nothing compared to Hashem. In fact, you can even use the phrase compared. Um, however, they show us what level they were on, that they could not see that he was finite and ended as Hashem was infinite. He was so much, he was so much, or we were so much above them. Interesting concept. Okay. So this is the, the, uh, the idea of Nida. It's um, a symbol, a uh, human reality, but a human reality which is symbolic of the change of metamorphosis that occurred, the spiritual metamorphosis occurred in the, in the Garden of Eden. Um, and therefore, women put this right with these three mitzvahs, as we said before. Adam has to put his uh, descent right, reverse it if he can, with his role as, it, as it's changed uh, in this world. And we have to, as it were, fight our way back out of the abyss that we fell into. Fine. That's really what I wanted to read to you from the Alshuk. There's actually a ton more to say here, but we'll leave it there for the moment. And let's just con <clears throat> concentrate on this concept. Um, as I said to you before, the fact that Chava was the, the person who was the instigator, and put that in inverted commas, but was the one who ate from the Eitzadas first, right, primary contamination, and then passed it on to Odom, uh, that doesn't, as I repeat what I said before, that means she was, the, she was the prime mover in changing the human condition, but in the new human condition, woman still remains superior to men. There's something called the Shem Mishmuel, one of the uh, greater, uh, greatest later Hasidic authorities, and later, of course, means 19th century. Uh, he says something which I always loved. And he points out that why is it that there is a double uh, level, double uh, time span, of Tuma if you give birth to a female child than a male child. To repeat, as we said at the beginning, 40 days of Tuma for a, a male child and 80 for, for a girl, for a, a female child. You might look and say, aha, they are more Tommy than a man is, than a boy is. Judaism favors men over women. So the Shem Mishra says something which is great, quoting the Kotzka Rebbe. Uh, the Kotzka Rebbe says something brilliant. You see, the question is like this. Why should there be any tumor with the birth of a child? He, puts it, he answers, looks at it completely differently. Why should there be any tumor? The most, as we said, the Alshaf himself said, um, in Bracious, which I read to you from my book in English, that there is uh, there's one part of a human being which has never been contaminated, never metamorphosized, and that's the neshama, that never changed. There's nothing holier in the world when the neshama comes into the world. When a Jewish child is born and a neshama comes into the world, that's nothing more holy in the world. That beats the angels. It's way above everything. And it's never contaminated by anything we do here. Whereas a nefesh, ruach, can be, the neshama never is. Now, if that's the case, um, if 
a holy thing is coming into the world. And there are other Kabbalistic sources that say that the ultimate midwife is Hashem Yisborach himself. He, the, the Shekhinah, the presence of God, of course, is a female uh, aspect of God. So the midwife is generally a, a woman. Um, that that's there at, the pre, uh, at every birth. Where is the room for Tuma? So the Kotzka Rebbe said, the Tuma is not from the birth of the child, but what happens afterwards. So think back to your high school signs. Nature abhors something. Nature abhors a vacuum. Uh, and indeed, we used to do experiments like that. You take a, a glass beaker, turn it upside down, take a Bunsen burner, um, uh, introduce the flame into inside the, the, the glass, cover it up, you created a vacuum, open it, of course, air rushes in to fill the vacuum. Nature abhors a vacuum. Now that space, not now a, a glass beaker, but the womb, which contained a neshama, once it's vacated, once the child has been discharged from the womb, and that space has been vacated, then different negative forces now rush in to fill the, the space that is occupied by something incredibly holy, a neshama, a human soul. That, or a super soul, as I say, uh, that means that in the case of a boy, it takes 40 days to, as it were, purge the, that negativity that's flowed into that space. In the case of, uh, of a girl, twice as much time, because there's twice as much Kedusha there. Indeed, a woman, in one, from one aspect of, of, of a woman, is, and indicated by Nida, they were, the pr they were the prime starters of the whole process. But in this process, women may have twice as much holiness, twice as much religious sensitivity, twice as much religious achievement from the get-go, as they say, from the outstart, outstart? Ooh, from the start, outstart, um, than do men. Ah. Can I prove this to you? Well, I would suggest you buy my book. Um, but the idea that, that, that Autumn did something wrong uh, as a consequence of Hava, uh, making him do something wrong, as I mentioned before, the metaphor of touching radioactive material in Chernobyl, then being so uh, exposed that you're going to die, and then touching somebody else and exposing them at perhaps a, obviously a lesser level. Um, let's see what Officer Rebbe Nossen has to say. So I'm opening the Talmud. Uh, one small version here, um, and I'm turning to Obister Rabbi Nelson, uh, and it says the following thing. Um, so here is the, I'll give you the headline from the from the Mishnah here, and it says the following. But also see the Torah. In the first paragraph, Pirkei Office, it says one of the things you're supposed to do is to make a fence around the Torah. What's a fence around the Torah? That means the Torah's laws, the primary Torah's laws, have to be protected by rabbinic intervention. Um, and that works as follows. Uh, you basically have to, uh, I'll give a, a simple example. On Shabbos, you're not allowed to write. You're not allowed to write in Shabbos. Uh, and that would be a primary Torah prohibition. The rabbis came along and say, a rabbinic prohibition is to touch a pen. So that becomes muksa, something you can't touch. You're making a fence around the primary Torah prohibition. The primary Torah prohibition is, of course, not writing. Don't touch a pen because you might accidentally come to write. That would be a classic example of making a siag offense around the Torah. And here in the Mishnah states, uh, many people did. Was a siag the Torah, um, and that is, um, and then talks about different things and make a offense around your words, uh, just like Hashem, uh, like Moshe Rabbeinu did, and just like Odom Arishan did. And then the Mishnah tells the famous story. And the famous story is like this Hashem says to Moshe, it says, sorry, it says to, uh, to Odom Arishan, you do not eat from the eight sadas. But when he reported that to his wife, Chav, he said, don't eat and don't touch. And again, we'll see that when the next we share Rabbi Dessler on the subject. Uh, if he's made a siag, a fence to protect the Torah, don't eat and don't touch, because if you touch, you might come to eat it. Then just like the rabbis in making a fence, don't touch the pen because you come to write, it's because they're scared. If you touch the pen, you come to write. If Adam has added to what God said, and God said to him, don't eat, if he has to, if he feels the necessity to add, don't touch, it's because he's scared that by touching it, you'll come to eat it. He was scared. More in Rabbi Dessler than the subject uh, uh, next week. He then says to Chava, we're not allowed to touch it and we're not allowed to eat it. And the Sultan engineers that she touches it. Some of them say he pushes her. So she touches that other says so one, of the, one of the fruits fell from the tree and she and touched her and she didn't die. Aha, you see, 
you got this wrong. You, you can touch these. He's, he's, he's not telling him the whole deal. Uh, that's just almost like a childlike uh, child's version of events. But basically, that's certainly what happens. And then she gives him to eat as well. So whose fault was it? Whose fault was it? So there's an idea of making a Siagra terror, of making laws to protect the primary terror's laws. But it mustn't be that the, the Siagra the offenses that you make are so um, strict that they, as it were, become the terror's laws. There's, make, there's protecting the terror and too much protection of the terror, and in which case defense becomes a barrier uh, to get to the terror as opposed to something that protects it. So um, let me read to you what some of the commentators say here, which I think is will add to our understanding. Um, so Benny Nishua, commentator, he says the following thing. From this story that I've just told you, it would seem the following thing. The Nochosh sought at the Sotan was not able to persuade Adam to eat from the tree of knowledge. Sheheshil is Chava, Kihu Yoda, Haemis, Shalon is Taba, Allah and Nagoim. He couldn't trip him in the same way because he couldn't persuade him that, oh, see, if you touch it, nothing will happen to you. He knew that because he knew that Hashem had said, don't eat from it. He knew that Hashem had said, don't touch. You could touch it. It's not a problem. I've got a copy of, I think I've told you before, over there of the Alshach and Kodesh. There, my finger is there, which is an original Alshach printed in Venice about four, 500 years ago by his son. It's covered in pigskin. Is there a halakhic problem having a Jewish book? A holy Jewish book covered in pigskin? Not in the slightest. Not in the slightest. Is there a halakhic problem of touching uh, the tree of knowledge? No. But the fact, as Robert Dessel will explain next week, that he had to do it shows that he thought there was. He was intimidated by it, and he passed on that to his wife, leaving her vulnerable, leaving her vulnerable to the attack of the Nachash. Then, in, in the little comment, commentary here called The Cobbets Mephorshim, he says the following thing. Um, from somebody called the Rishon Lassian. Um, Lekach, he shall es chavim. Odom a Rishon in adding to, because you're not allowed to take away from the Torah, you're not allowed to add to the Torah. You're not allowed to add more than is necessary to protect the Torah. Lekach, he shall es chavim shuhu sfora sha'af hanagoyim beklal hatzivu. Listen to the Hebrew here, it's astonishing. Lekach, he shall, he caused her to trip. He caused, Odomeration caused Chava to trip by telling her something which was not actually demanded by God, which exposed her to manipulation by the Nochesh, by the Yitzhahora, and then she gets contaminated, she contaminates him, they contaminate us, there needs to be a process to undo all of this. Brismila is part of that process. It's a statement we want to undo this. Keeping Taras Mishpocha, Keeping uh, the laws of Nida is a tr an attempt to reverse the effects of these things. But ultimately, it was Odom's mistake which led to the whole thing. And we'll talk about that in more in depth next week when we show you what Rabbi Desla has to say on the subject. So, um, Isha Kathazria, we've now answered some of our questions. Why, what Nida really is all about? Why is it such a big deal about Nida? And the answer is it's part of a woman's task to try and reverse the damage that the first woman did. Men obviously did the same, a, a similar process, but obviously in a different way. Uh, why is brismila there? That's what we're talking about men. We, we do brismila to, as it were, uh, take away the legacy, or try and reverse the legacy of, of what Odom did, that, rever that added to what Chaba did, that turned us into physical beings would eventually die. That's not what the way we were meant to be before. I shall look forward to adding an extra set, uh, shear this week on, on the subject from Rabbi Dessa. I hope you'll join me if you see it ad, uh, advertised that pops up in your, uh, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube or on the uh, Torah anytime. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoy that as well. Let me obviously wish you a great Shabbos and uh, see you next week. <laughs>